The first really cool property is that if you have the definite integral from 0 to some real number a of a real value function f of x, and you're integrating with respect to x, it's equal to the definite integral from 0 to a of the same function f integrated with respect to x. Only difference is that you have to replace the x with an a minus x, where a is the upper limit of integration. To prove that what I've written is actually valid, we're going to name the integral we have as i. So i is the integral from 0 to a of f of x with respect to x, and we're going to perform a substitution that you might be familiar with if you've integrated trig functions before using phase shifting. So we're going to define a substitution as let x equal the upper limit of integration a minus t. So this would imply that dx equals the negative of dt. And this implies that your integral now becomes the integral from, what are the limits of integration now? Well, if x equals 0 as here, then a minus 0 is a. So that's your lower limit of integration, a. And the upper limit is going to be a minus a, which is 0. So that's your upper limit. You have a negative sign out here because of the dt term. And you now are integrating the function f of a minus t with respect to t. Now, if I switch up the limits of integration because they look kind of weird, uh, so I'm integrating from 0 to a now, and that will add another negative sign out here, which will convert the initial one into a positive sign. So this is the integral from 0 to a of a minus t with respect to t. So here is some common sense stuff now that if you have the uh, integral from a to b of some function g of t with respect to t, and if you do nothing to the structure of your integral, meaning you're integrating again from a to b, the same function g, but you just change the variable's name. You're just changing the variable's name from t to x, say. So obviously this will not change the results of integration and it won't change because it won't change the structure of your integral. So I can just replace the t's here with x's. So uh, let me just write this down more neatly. So i now equals the integral from 0 to a of f of a minus x with respect to x. Now wait a second. If this is i and this is i as well, and so they both represent the same integral, hence they're equal, and we have the uh, equality of these two integrals that I had just written at the start of the video. There's even a more general version to the equality we just proved, that if you're integrating on any interval of real numbers, it's not necessary that the lower limit should be zero. So if you're integrating uh, from a to b some function f of x with respect to x, then again, you can write this as the integral from a to b of the same function f uh, and you're integrating with respect to x again. The only difference is that Instead of x, you're going to write here a plus b minus x. So the proof of this is left as an exercise to you, and it follows the exact same principles as the equality, as the proof to the equality uh, we just did before. Now for an equality that looks kind of wacky. So you're integrating from 0 to twice of some real number a. And you're integrating f of x with respect to x. So this is actually equal to the integral from 0 to a of f of x with respect to x plus the integral again from 0 to a of f of 2a minus x with respect to x. Now this does seem kind of weird at first, but it can be proved pretty easily. I mean, you let i equal to, oh, sorry about that. You let i equal to uh, the integral from 0 to 2a of f of x with respect to x. And you just break down the, lim the uh, interval on which you're integrating from 0 to a and a to 2a. Again, sorry about that. Uh, f of x with respect to x plus sign here and f of x with respect to x, of course. So forgive my handwriting. It seems to have... You let i equal to the integral from 0 to 2a of f of x with respect to x, and you just break down the interval on which you're integrating. So instead of from 0 to 2a, you're integrating from 0 to a 
plus you're integrating from a to 2a and you're integrating f of x with respect to x of course so i'm going to take this uh, second integral here because if you look at the uh, the two equalities if you look at the two equalities the first one this one here is the same so all i have to do now is prove the equality of these two things over here so you take the integral from zero oh sorry about that from a from a to 2a of f of x with respect to x and you call it i1 and you perform once again a substitution where we let x equal to 2a minus t which again implies that dx equals the negative of dt and what this does to your integral is that you're now integrating from where if x equals uh, if as x approaches a we have 2a minus a which is a and 2a minus 2a is 0 anyway so we have a negative sign out here because of the negative dt and we're now integrating f of 2a minus t with respect to t and again if you perform that same trick of switching up the limits of integration you're you now you're now integrating the function f of 2a minus t with respect to t and this is equal to i1 where once again you can use the same common sense thing that we did before and replace the uh, the variable's name by uh, from a t to an x so there you have it sorry about that so there you have it that's the equality of the two integrals on the right and hence we can now conclude that the integral from 0 to 2a of some function of uh, some real function f of x equals the integral from 0 to a of f with respect to x plus the integral again from 0 to a of f of 2a minus x with respect to x. The third property is pretty useful, especially when it, when it comes to trig functions. So uh, according to this property, that if you have the uh, integral from 0 to twice of some real number a of some real function f of x with respect to x, and this function here, f, it satisfies a certain property that if you plug in 2a minus x, if you plug in this expression, it's going to be equal to the function f of x, as in the structure of the function is not altered in any way if you plug in 2a minus x. So if this is the case, if the function f has this property, then you can write its integral as the integral from 0 to a of f of x with respect to x, but with a2 being multiplied out here. Now, there's another uh, side of this coin, that if the function has the property that f of 2a minus x is equal to the negative of f of x, if this is the case, then in that case, the definite integral from 0 to 2a of the function is going to be 0. You can prove this on grounds similar to the earlier two proofs, and that is left as an exercise to the reader or the watcher, the viewer in this case. And now that we've learned all that stuff, now we should apply it to some example. Now I thought of assigning this as a homework problem, but then I thought that no way, this is kind of easy. I should solve it myself and assign the difficult or the harder problems to you later. So uh, this integral honestly doesn't look too bad. It doesn't. The only thing bothering me is the x here in the numerator. So any trig substitutions uh, or any kind of substitutions, to be honest, won't... Uh, that they may make things even more cumbersome than they already are so uh, we can get rid of this x if we use a uh, if we make use of the first property that we learned so if, so we have the definite integral from 0 to pi of some function f of x with respect to x and we know that's equal to the definite integral from 0 to pi of some of the same function f but with the x replaced by a pi minus x term right so that means the numerator becomes pi minus x and as for, as far as the uh, trig functions in the denominator are concerned uh, one is the cosine of pi minus x whole squared and the other is the sine of pi minus x squared again so because these are uh, integer multiples of pi the ratios won't change and the squares will take care of the signs so you can verify that on your own as well, but it's pretty obvious. So this is going to be equal to the cosine squared of x uh, and sine squared x. So the denominator looks exactly the same, but 
we can actually do something with the numerator. We can separate the terms here using the common denominator. So the integral i is now going to be equal to that, uh, the integral from 0 to pi of pi. And I'll just write this out here as a constant. So dx up here and down here we had exactly the same denominator, a squared cos uh, cosine squared x plus b squared sine squared x. And there was a minus sign in the middle and an integral from 0 to pi of x divided by a squared cosine squared x uh, plus b squared times the sine, uh, the square of the sine of x. So this second integral here, this is just the integral i, correct? So this is i and there's a negative sign here so I can take it to the other side and add it to the first i. So you're going to get a uh, 2i and if you just divide by 2 that will cancel out so you're left with pi divided by 2 the integral from 0 to pi dx by a squared cosine square x plus b squared sine square x okay this can actually get even better because right now you're integrating from 0 to pi but it would be more useful if you were integrating from 0 to pi by 2 and it may not seem obvious right now but you'll agree with me in a short while. So you're integrating from 0 to pi so that's basically the same as integrating from 0 to twice of the real number pi by 2. And the function that you're integrating, uh, this function over here 1 by a squared co cosine square x plus b squared sine square x this is the function of x that you're integrating and this function has the obvious property that if you replace x by uh, twice of this real number pi by 2 minus x and 2 times pi by 2 is just pi, right? So if you replace x by this term over here that I'm underlining, if you replace x by this term, you're going to get f of x back, right? you're going to get f of x back. So when we have a situation like this, when we have a scenario like that, instead of integrating to twice that real number, just integrate to that real number and double the result. So you're integrating from 0 to pi by 2 now. And why was that useful? Well, just give me a minute to uh, actually write the integral. That's pi, and up here is pi by 2, and dx by a squared uh, cosine square x plus b squared sine square x. What you can do is you can divide downstairs and upstairs by the uh, square of the cosine of x. So that has the added benefit of giving you a secant square x up top and down here you have an a square plus b square times the square of the tangent of x. And now the substitution the t substitution that we're going to perform becomes pretty obvious and you know what just factor out this a squared so if you factor it out you actually have a an a squared outside and a b squared by a squared here and uh, if you now perform that uh, t substitution that I was talking about if you perform that t substitution where I'm going to let b by a times tangent of x equal to t, which would imply that b by a times the secant square of x, and you can add that b by a here and then a by b down here as well, uh, dx equals dt. And now for the limits of integration, as x approaches 0, we see that t should approach 0 as well. But when x approaches pi by 2, then t should approach positive infinity. However, if you are integrating from 0 to pi, then in that case both the upper and lower limits would approach 0 and your integral would become 0. Having a 0 integral means that the area under the curve is 0. But you can see that's clearly not possible here because you have squares, I mean positive numbers everywhere. You have positive numbers everywhere and then, then how would you actually get a 0 area under the curve? So that wouldn't make sense, right? So even without seeing the graph, we see that uh, we're going to have to make this modification to our integral, the modification that we just made, going from instead of 0 to pi, we went from 0 to pi by 2. So that means our integral is now that of, uh, it's going to be equal to pi by a times b, 
uh, 0 to pi by oh, 0 to infinity now because I am now in the t world and I have dt up here and 1 plus t squared down here which is obviously just the inverse tangent function. So this is the inverse tangent of t, uh, limits are 0 and infinity, plug in the limits you get pi by 2 so the end result is pi squared by 2 times a b which deserves a like and subscribe. So be sure to do that. I hope you found the video useful and I hope you enjoyed the video as well. Thank you. See you next time.